Hello and welcome back to Dreamforce 2024 from the NYSE. Our studio is built right up the street from the Moscone Center. We're wrapping things up with day two of Dreamforce, which is actually their day one. Uh, there's been a lot going on today, a lot of keynotes, a lot of platform talk. We've been talking a lot about ecosystem. We've had uh, from a lot of the ecosystem that are building on top of Salesforce as a platform, doing things with AI and agents, as well as some of the partners where they're selling in their marketplaces such as IBM and AWS. It's been a fascinating full two days, uh, to put it mildly, and we're really excited to break this down. Uh, today, to help me wrap this up, I'm once again joined by Christoph Bertrand, who's one of our principal analysts with the Cube Research, and George Gilbert, who's one of our principal analysts also with the Cube Research. So guys, and I'll kind of throw this to George first. We've been talking about platforms and data. We had some really great guests from Salesforce on uh, with MK and David, and we're really digging in. What's your takeaway so far about the platform aspect? Well, I, I think there's a reason why Mark Benioff said this, the most important dream force ever. You know, this is now um, 25 years since they founded the company because it's very, very hard to turn a platform company into an application company or vice versa. And if they pull this off, um, they'll be one of the largest to have ever done it and they'll transform the company. And that's sort of a sort of cloud level way of saying, and no pun intended, of saying that um, all the data that Salesforce has accumulated and help um, their customers shape and inform. So it's not just the customer 360, but anything that customers choose to connect to the customer 360 that can activate, used to be like activate a marketing campaign or you know nurture a lead. Now it activates an agent and an agent embodies business processes that were too complicated to specify. Now they learn and they can, um, now Salesforce becomes the platform on which others can build agents. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think one of the things, and Christoph and I have been talking to a lot of the ecosystem who've, I think ecosystem has been out in front of this a little bit on Salesforce and building on top of the platform because ultimately, uh, you know, having used Salesforce myself at multiple different startups, it really is difficult to program. And when you programmed into Force, Dot com and what have you on top of Salesforce, it became very static and making those changes. So to your point, I think they, if they can pull this off where it becomes a more dynamic app platform, more personalized, really focused on those processes all the way back to the data, it's going to be you know a clear win for them. And especially where they've abstracted and they're not, they're, they're not a cloud, they're sitting on cloud. They're sitting on IaaS, and I, I think that's a huge win for them, is that they are SaaS from that perspective. So what about yourself, Christoph? What have you been seeing? Well, I'd like to uh, sort of go a little further than this and say it's not just clouds, a hybrid cloud. It's also DB2 and mainframe. Uh, it's working with IBM, for example. Great conversation we had with the head of global partnerships on this topic. And all of this is also uh, uh, very interesting from the perspective of the how nimble it makes the ecosystem. I mean, you're right, a platform, George, is something you build on. That's the definition, right? But it has to be pervasive. And I think by being so open to many data sources, uh, multiple um, uh, hybrid cloud type of environments, that's going to be the key. Now, the challenge that I see also for every opportunity, there is a challenge or more, uh, will be how do you really keep things compliant? How do you keep things governed? Uh, that's really the biggest question I have because the, the, the play here is a scale play. And with scale comes a lot of responsibility and complexity. I, I do have one comment to add on that from previous um, interviews with MK, who's, who's president of the developer platform, um, which is um, we used to build data platforms with role-based access control. Like here, you belong to this role, this role gets access to these you know, tables or columns or whatever. Now, um, the most advanced data platforms like um, Salesforce have a policy-based um, security uh, model where you can put tags on the data and then formulas as to you know, who gets access to data by what tag. 
I know that's dropping into the weeds, but it's part of part of the theme that it's not just good enough to have a data lake with a very high performance right. SQL database anymore. It's the meaning uh, you put on top of it, the policy you put on top of it. To your right. point, the um, low code tools and. It, Salesforce had the low-code tools. Now, by putting the agents in them, you can program those low-code tools either with English or just giving them a goal, and they figure out the context from the data and the available right. actions. Well, that's going to be key. I will, I will tell you why. Because you're going to have all of these AI workers, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, and how many are going to have in any environment? It's, it's going to be ridiculous, the number of, of agents that might be running in a large environment as the ecosystem matures and the use cases expand. So I think it's going to be more than the metadata tagging at the data level. It's also going to be managing all those um, AI workers. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think building off both what you're both saying is that the fact that these agents are doing business processes, you know, it's doing revenue recognition, it's doing, you know, closing of a sales campaign, it's doing a flagging of uh, distressed customers within, you know, a service cloud or what have you. I think what they're doing is really trying to enable people. I, I, I like Benioff's talk, and we heard it from David as well, that really, you know, who's president and chief product officer, uh, David Schmeier, it's it really, it's about enabling people. And I, I think they weren't getting ahead of their skis with their agents and saying this is going to replace people. It's their talk track to it was, this is super important to pay, make people more efficient, especially in this market, this economy where you're talking about how you, you if you can find the right people, they're hard to retain. If you can't, you know, most of the time you can't find the right people so, and you can't afford them for that matter. So I, I think it's a very interesting dynamic going on in the ecosystem around them where there are some that are saying, hey, this is replacement. And I think to the whole data, I, I mean, data we know is what AI is built on. We've talked about it all you know, this week. We've talked about it weeks before. I think the control of that data and the control of the metadata. It will be interesting because MuleSoft gives them some advantages and their you know, zero ETL alliance that they have with AWS, IBM, Databricks, I believe Snowflake's in there and others makes a lot of sense, but the metadata doesn't necessarily travel with that in that context. So I wonder at, at what level can they bring and bridge enough of the other data within an organization to really have the ownership and be that platform? So that that's what I find interesting. Okay, it's a good point. And I, to that, I would... Oh, I got Siri talking to me. Um, okay, that's a, that's like, you know, in the weather reports where the cat hops up on the weatherman. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would point out um, that... The idea of this federated query in their data platform, they want to be the historical source of truth. And to do that, some of the data that they can federate out to actually fits into harmonized definitions of the customer. Not all of it. So there's graceful, it can gracefully degrade. degrade. Um, and, and the policy actually, the issue of the policy, it applies both to humans and to agents. And what we'll likely see is a org chart for agents that complements an org chart for humans. And agents can call on other agents. And when they, they are not confident of a step in a process or, or an outcome, they can then bounce up to the, an inbox to a human to supervise them. And the point of all this isn't to eliminate humans so much as to capture expertise for the easily um, the, the easy uh, jobs and processes, not full jobs, processes or tasks within jobs, and, and that you're embodying in this org chart of agents the, um, the expertise to perform more and more of the routine functions in an organization, and then it up-levels the humans. It's interesting what you're mentioning here because I go back to a conversation we had with own company on, on backup and recovery and the fact that, well, they literally keep an archive of all the data. I mean, yeah. they see everything. It's backup and recovery. So having access to all of this now becomes a way to augment further all of this work that's going to happen at the data level and at the platform level, but also a way to go back and, and, and really inspect what may be going on, what's happening. So there are really a couple of uh, bi-directional conversations going on here. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think one of the interesting things is, and I think this actually brings it all, you know, 
we keep going up and down the stack. I think one of the things that was interesting was uh, how they're, they're bringing forward Heroku as well and talking about how the developer lifecycle, because I think when you, to your point, I think that people are going to look at AI and agents and they're going to want to be able to control the CICD for these agents. They're going to need lineage. They're going to need all of these pieces to be combined. So if you're going to have a platform, you almost have to have that Heroku, which, hey, it understands Kubernetes under the hood. It knows how to actually distribute it. It knows how to put the things in the right places and orchestrate that from a Kubernetes perspective. It takes away and simplifies the platform so they, they work on developing the agents and connecting the data and you know, again, trying to figure out, you know, how is all the lineage work and all of this, that's a whole different story that I didn't hear much about. But I think it, when you look at it, it's abstracting the infrastructure. And I think we, we briefly talked about that yesterday. Yeah, you know, it brings up a great, uh, your point really um, shines a light on what they kept trying to say in the keynote, which is don't do it yourself. And the whole point about the DevOps that you're talking about, DevOps for an agent is there's a continual, it's not just release cycle, but a continual capture of the exception conditions. The exception conditions become teachable moments. And then you look at those and you say, okay, which ones had favorable outcomes, which ones had unfavorable ones. And then the idea is that you periodically capture those, you add them either to the prompt database or to the fine tuning. And then the distribution of outcomes becomes narrower around the best practice for that task. And so it's, it's a whole different tool chain. But underneath, you still need the data lineage to make sure right. that the data that the agent is using as context is trustworthy. Look, it's always going to be about good data. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So that's the part to me that's the constant. So mm -hmm. it, it has been the constant since mainframe. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so that's that's number one. I think number two is, um, uh, you know, to, to, to you know, how do you train agents? How do you train humans to train agents, and vice versa? I think we will see in the future how things evolve. But I do believe that while there will be some entry level jobs, very likely that were not that productive to begin with, that may be eliminated, it's an opportunity for a lot of people to actually go up their own stack, if you will, in terms of professional uh, excellence, to be empowered and augmented by agents. Um, I think I can think of 20, 25 or 30 examples a day where I would love to be able to do more by just asking a couple of smart you know questions to a smart person when I have to resolve something. So I think that's that's one of the, the, the promises. Again, I think it's early stages. Um, I haven't seen a lot of metrics on any of this yet, and that is something that bothers me a little bit. Oh, it's interesting that you should uh, mention metrics, because um, one of the things that we will see, right now metrics are, they're isolated, you know, dashboards, they're frozen, they're, they're one way, they're like looking in, you know, the looking glass. But we're going to find metrics are not just what you measure, um, like, human or organizational performance by, but those are going to be the metrics by which agents measure their performance. And so you need to make sure you're choosing the right metrics. They all form a tree. It's not like a Newtonian machine because mm -hmm. a little bit of a change here and a little bit of a change there might make somewhat of a change here. Um, it's, it's more of a, you know, of a complex system, but the agents are going to be in their own org chart wired up to this metric of how the organization performs. Now, this sounds like, you know, like it's a uh, blue sky, but it, it's actually a journey where you wire up the agents bit, I'm sorry, you wire up the metrics bit by bit, you get the relationships between them, higher fidelity, and then you connect the agents, you know, progressively to more and more of the metrics. And that's how you align the agent behavior with the goals of the organization. Yeah, I, I, I think, just building off of that, I thought what was really interesting was how they talked about how people are going to actually add to agents. So customization of the agents yeah. and adding, you know, different ways of doing tasks or, you know, to your point about, hey, what are the, uh, what are the anomalies that I see in the agent behavior and become a teachable moment for the agent is going to differ company to company. And I, I think this was the thing that I sat there and, you know, it was 
interesting to see and kind of just to, just to compo- compare this towards <laughs> last week when we were talking about Oracle releasing yeah. 51 different agents, which is still 30 some odd more than, than Salesforce announced this week. But is it around volume or is it about efficiency? Is, are we going to get agent to death? I, and we were talking to uh, some of the organizations that were coming through, and it was, one of the interesting theories was, you know, last year it was all about co-pilots. This year it's all about agents. And I, I think people are still grasping at the ROI, the, the ROI of AI, and trying to see, okay, what work will get achieved by these agents now that used to be co-pilots that were very broad. Now agents are very task oriented and focused. What are you seeing when you were when you were talking to other people as well and, and, and floating around? Are people looking to use the packaged agents or are they looking that they're they're they feel like they're, you know, snowflakes and that they have not and not the company, but no you know, no no. The, <laughs> that was a good good analogy. Yeah. I think what what's going on is that um, you need to show concrete solution-oriented value to get in the door. So there's at least one agent in at least in each of the clouds. You know whether it's marketing cloud, commerce cloud, revenue and order um, service. There's got to be at least one agent. Usually there's there's um, a couple in each of the clouds. But the critical one then is the agent development toolkit, where it's now. With low code, it was already a revolution in accessibility to corporate or citizen developers to um, to adapt these clouds to their processes. But now with agents, they can go an order of magnitude, two order of magnitudes farther in terms of usability and crucially in the types of processes they can accommodate. Because when you programmed um, with low code before or any symbolic programming language, you were basically saying, I know the answer and it follows the sequence of steps. With agents, you get to the other 80% where you're saying, well, let me just show you some examples. Um, We call it the the dark matter of processes where you show it some examples and you give it a goal and it sort of figures out how to do it. And, but the building blocks are in the applications. That's what Salesforce has, perhaps Oracle, that that just a pure data platform does not have. You know, I'm going to take this uh, back to the business level, uh, kind of a a notch up from the technology here. When I'm hearing this, I'm immediately thinking, well, if I want to differentiate my business, whatever business I'm in, I'm going to invest in the best agent people who can understand agents, develop them, uh, integrate them, because that's where competitive differentiation will end up happening. I'll be more efficient as a business uh, and in a sense, it's sort of giving power back to humans in many ways uh, that way. But I do believe that's a fundamental, in time, fundamental business uh, move to invest in this type of technology, and specifically the agent uh, components at the process level, at the outcome level. Yeah, I, I think actually that was a, that's a great segue into the discussion we did have with uh, David around this, uh, Schmeier, and I think part of it was when he brought up that, you know, we have these PhDs out of Stanford and all of these people, and we have that group and doing R&D. It, it actually reminded me when you and I were sitting with Ali Godsey and, and, and Databricks, it's like, yeah, we have Mosaic, and we have all these really smart people and all these people from Cal. It's almost becoming a university versus university mm-hmm. fight from a platform perspective, because I think to exactly what you're looking for is Salesforce is saying sitting back and saying I don't want to hi- I don't you know most companies don't want to hire Cal Stanford MIT whoever they can't yeah they can't yeah. and don't and shouldn't for that matter right it's not their core IP unless they're they already have them for doing quant and all of the other ML training and trading. I mean, I could see it in the financial services. The data but if, science. Yeah. But if you're a healthcare company, you're, you're an HMO, uh, why would you go and, you know, hire all these really expensive, you're not. So you're going to look for something like a platform to your exact point, because you can't go find the agent builders. You're going to want to start somewhere with these agents. So when I look at what Salesforce is doing, we had numerous others on, uh, the, 
we had some great people talking about how they're helping build agents or building agents for specific uh, things like, hey, you know, going through and quoting, you know, configure price and quote, or going through and helping find different defects in uh, experience for organizations as they go through their customer journey. I think it's, you know, organizations are going to customize heavily customize a lot of their agents to help them in particular parts. And I, I think that's where it becomes is who, you have these agent tuners, I guess you could say, right. out there in agent tuning shops, which if you look around at who's going to be on the floor, there are a ton of, uh, I would say, you know, systems integrators and global systems integrators that are glad to be down there. I know we, we talked about one of them with, uh, was part of their announcement with an agent force was Accenture and others that are out there to me is is this is this moving the bottleneck of agents yet up another level where i i don't still think the data part is solved yet i i'm i'm still thinking there's things to solve there but at the same time i think that how we get to the stack has moved up and the problem is moving up now to how we're going to program these agents and customize them well that that i I couldn't agree more, although I would say the frontier is moving actually at all the levels. And you, the agents, you can't even do agents if you don't have access to the data platform, this, the system of truth, uh, both the historical one and the real-time one. And, and it's not even meaningful unless it's harmonized so it's in the same language. And then at the, at the agent development level, you need tools that allow you, you to allow your domain experts to express in their language their thought processes on how to get a job done, that's how you capture the expertise, like you're saying. But the capabilities of the agents behind those tools that capture the expertise, those are improving. And then you need um, this agent control framework that sort of gives context to the org chart for agents, which is basically, think of it as an org chart of microservices that think, you know, and then those are all tied into the outcomes, both the transactional apps and the metrics that measure them. Yeah, and, and I think to what we were talking about earlier as well, when you get to below that, I guess you could say below the agent, below the data, and you get into that infrastructure and those infrastructure services, they're, they're looking to abstract those for people too. I mean, they go and make the acquisition of own company, you know, tentative to approvals and all of that stuff. It would seem like they're, they're really cementing themselves from that layer up and is that what you were seeing? Yes, I mean, I think literally you think about history and other companies you mentioned, Oracle, well, that protection of the data component was was a, a big move for them uh, many, many years ago, uh, very similarly. So I think it's a sign of uh, yeah, maturing uh, offering. And, and I think they identified in the case of data protection and, and really recoverability, which is, so it's recoverability, it's traceability, it's all sorts of things, but fundamentally it's the ability to recover your, your data. Everything we've said, Nothing happens without the data, period. Right. Let's never right. forget that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I think what's really interesting about what you were just saying there is, and I, I think this is the interesting part of the platform right now. They're you know mainly deployed on AWS, Salesforce is, and when you start to look at these other pieces they're right. bringing into that platform, they're there's no doubt they'll go to other clouds, and we know we know they already are, but you know won't go into that. I think one of the interesting parts is that they're building some of the ser infrastructure services into there so that you can have pro developers with Heroku and yeah. and some of the infrastructure pieces because they know it, it's their it if their platform has issues, security, right. governance, data corruption, then it's data game over. It's then game it's over. game over. So they know they can't it's interesting where it's almost a trust but verify, where <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're really building into the infrastructure their own ways of doing all of this stuff because they want to be able to be the ones, if the customer comes and points the finger at them and says, my data is gone, my agents can't transact, you're costing me a billion dollars a day or yeah. you know, a million dollar a minute or whatever the, the number is, my agents need to be reliable. And that that's one part where today we're we're okay with ninety you know eighty percent accuracy ninety percent accuracy, but we'll get to a point where they they're ninety eight point five ninety eight point seven and stuff like that. 
How do you see that from like jiving with the whole platform aspect of it? Okay, so there's there's two aspects. There's there's infrastructure reliability and some amount of that Amazon can build in and they're, you know, within the um, within a region across the availability zones um, or the software vendor can also build into their software so they can be robust to failures maybe even at the region level. But then then you're also talking about at the agent level, which is agents are probabilistic computing primitives. You don't you're not guaranteed to get the same answer every time you run the same thing, which means if you, you want to pick a process that for the agent that doesn't require 100% reliability, but what you do want are some high value processes where when you capture more and more the domain expertise and the teachable moments, which are exception conditions, you narrow the distribution so that the you're, you're getting higher and higher reliability over time. So it's very different. There's infrastructure reliability and, and then there's the agent reliability, but also one other thing, um, on the infra, on abstracting the cloud infrastructure, they are using, as far as I understand, nothing more than Kubernetes. We heard this from a senior exec yesterday on Amazon, which means it's not going to be all that hard should they choose to port some cloud, some part of the cloud, or some of the clouds to another hyperscaler for for sovereign re regions or reasons. Or, or you know, or just optionality and price negotiation, you know, capabilities. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I don't uh, even think they're using the native. They may or may not be using native EKS, for instance, in Amazon, uh, because of the Heroku acquisition and how they do containers under the hood. I would not even be surprised if they're using just EC2 instances and rolling their own there and uh, actually doing that. But they could be using it for load balancers and other things, yeah. other pieces. But to your point, that's They're stacked. just commoditizing the cloud vendor. Co correct. The, you used to build your apps, you used to build your custom mm -hmm. apps on the cloud vendor, and yes. you used Salesforce for your out-of-the-box apps. Right. But that the, the distinction between those is blurring, except that it's not that you're sometimes using the cloud vendor. You're almost always now building your custom apps on the building blocks of Salesforce. Right, which is where the value is. The value is whoever runs the business process is going to get the most value as a platform, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's really the play. It has always been the play. I think that's what we're seeing here. Um, let's see how it evolves. Uh, I, I think this, to your point, Rob, there's still a lot of work to do at the infrastructure level, which is absolutely the condition for anything else to really work well. But clearly the dynamic is uh, the train has left the station. Let's, uh, let's face it. Yeah. So how about this? Final thought? Um, I guess final thought is... Um, you know, there used to be a distinction between dessert toppings and floor waxes, and <laughs> it's kind of my favorite analogy, the, you know, that they're, you know, now which is it? You know, you're getting both platform and application from Salesforce. Now, their, their exec said yesterday it's going to take, you know, over the next year for this thing to get sort of shaken out, the bugs shaken out. Uh, he didn't say bugs, but, you know, for it to mature. But, um, this has been a dream for decades for the major application vendors that they become application platforms. Let's see if they can pull it off. Yourself? Well, uh, very much building on this thought is, so who's going to be running this then? Is it the people who are here today, like six, five years from now, or will it be a different profile of professionals? And what is that going to do to their ability to keep selling and upselling, et cetera, right? Because now you're talking about a different persona potentially. Or because of the heritage and really training, are you going to help people evolve and actually, to the point I was making earlier, augment their own careers by leveraging AI and by sort of going along with the, uh, the, the, the same journey? To me, that's the interesting part here. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. And I, I think, again, this journey for the next year, I think, again, they, it's ambitious. It's super ambitious. I, I love the mojo they have going. I love the, the energy they have here. Again, you start to see, we go to a lot of these conferences, and there's just a lot of definitely mojo going on. And I think, you know what, this is a great place to leave it. So thank you for joining us live from Dreamforce 2024 partnered up here with the NYSE. They lent us this beautiful studio to set up in, and we got some great people going through. Go back and check them out. Also check out all the news on silkenangle.com. Thanks to Chuck and Brendan for really 
supporting us this week. I think, again, this really has been awesome. And thank you guys for being on board with me. And, uh, you know, we'll see you guys soon. Take care.